All right. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I really wish that you could be here in Helsinki. It is plus 28, I guess. Sunshine, absolutely beautiful weather. But maybe one day uh, we can invite you all to, to pay a site visit, real site visit in, in Helsinki, Finland. So you might wonder, uh, what is a Director General of Strategic Affairs and Chief Medical Officer doing here uh, in this meeting? And I was wondering myself uh, what kind of a presentation I could put uh, together for you. And I, I uh, found myself browsing uh, through my old presentations and I picked slides from the presentations uh, during past maybe two or three years. And then I added some. So this is sort of a little bit like historical overview of uh, where we come from. And I hope that I will uh, sort of uh, uh, set the stage for future speakers in this uh, meeting because they will uh, take you through more detailed overviews of some of the pillars of the health growth strategy. So I am a, a little bit like uh, uh, setting the stage. I will not repeat what Anni already said. I, I can, uh, uh, I, I really could uh, agree with her about how we in the ministries view strategies like this. Um, but I can say from the point of view of the health system that this has been a huge paradigm change. If I compare the atmosphere in the health system, say 10, 15 years ago, and if, if you would have raised the issue of uh, public-private partnership, co-creation, co-innovation, uh, with uh, healthcare managers and directors, that would have been a little bit like a strange situation, but it's no more. And I think that that's one of the great benefits of the health growth strategy seen from the point of view of the health system. And as Anni already said, this is one of the very few uh, documents that has survived at least two parliamentary elections and a bit and several more uh, coalition government changes and has always been signed by ministries from uh, ministers from three different ministries. And the latest addition, which was the um, roadmap, is, is quite a different document. And I think that it very well illustrates the development of the strategy, uh, strategical thinking that we all share uh, from a cookbook type of document to a real strategy. So the phenotype of the strategy has varied over time, but I think that it always reflected the strategic goal of supporting and facilitating the creation and establishment of living ecosystems. Uh, they have different starting points, and I picked two. I picked the Finnish Cancer Center which was built uh, on the basis of the university hospitals and their cancer clinics and the other central hospitals in the five university uh, hospital catchment areas. So why was this? This was because the main incentive was to overcome the obstacles of geography, the decentralized healthcare system in Finland and the unevenly distributed population. So this was uh, actually part of the hospital reform and has been backed by the government decree and cooperation agreement between the five university hospitals. So this is one of the pillars and is already up and running and recruiting now for the first time the national director of this new network and organization. Another starting point is of course research. And so the Neurocenter Finland is, was university-based. It was coordinated from the very beginning by the University of Eastern Finland. And it represents the desire uh, to be stronger together uh, in research collaboration. So together, these neurocenters or brain disease, whatever you, you name it, might be stronger. Neither of these two approaches be it based on health system or be it based on academia is not an easy exercise. You know, this is a very 
competitive field. And it sometimes needed a little bit of a push from the ministries and from the political end that these actually came true. So the Minister of Education and Culture is unfortunately not represented here through the coincidences and they also have the science department. So I borrowed one slide uh, from Prime Minister Sanna Marin's government's program, uh, which uh, Anni actually also made reference to. So to increase the intensity of R&D activities from the current level uh, back to the roughly 4 or 4.5 percent by 2030. So it used to be about that high. And then there was the collapse of the Nokia, which brought it back down to two point something. Uh, and uh, without going into to, uh, details, there's a new parliamentary committee established quite recently to look for the uh, means how we can raise uh, this intensity back to four plus something percent. But I would like to draw your attention to the last bullet point on this slide, linking R&D activities to support the new renewal of the public sector and okay. service, including the health and social services. And at this point, I might mention that some of you might know that for the past 10 plus years, Finland has be working uh, towards a uh, social and health care reform because our health and social system is extremely decentralized. Uh, the power is the hands of uh, roughly 250 different municipal organizations. But now, finally, yesterday, uh, the new legislation passed the committees in the parliament and the, only the final voting is missing and we would uh, have the transition to 21 regional organizers of all health and social care from 250 to 21. So you can understand this is one of the biggest public power changes in Finland during our independence. So a huge political move. And that the health and social care system has been unsure and insecure in an insecure situation about the future of the reform has been one of the obstacles that's let's let's face it has a little bit slowed down uh, the implementation of the health growth strategy in the system because the energy has gone someplace else to the political debate of the future of the system. So um, uh, having said that, so seen from the Finnish health systems perspective, the health growth strategy has had many pillars or expressions. And you will be hearing uh, more about many of these uh, pillars mentioned on this a little bit busy slide. Uh, but I would say that from the bird's eye view, uh, the growing emphasis has been on creating and supporting the national infrastructures that have something to do with data. Creation, processing, utilization, regulation of sensitive personal information. And genomic data is only the tip of the iceberg. I want to emphasize it, only the tip of the iceberg. But at the same time, sort of a magnifying glass that brings into focus all the aspects that we have to face when we start to regulate, process, and utilize this kind of information in modern society. So, um, of course, the um, the backbone, the cornerstone, is, is the uh, National Patient Data Repository, Kanta, which has been in action for quite many years already and is, is, is obligatory to all healthcare providers in Finland. We don't have one uniform health uh, patient record system, but it is an ecosystem of different uh, systems brought together to a single repository. Um, and this is open to both professionals and citizens themselves. Um, and we couldn't imagine life without this kind of a national patient data repository. The latest additions will be also the social care data. And uh, if I might mention just one detail, so uh, all the prescriptions are digital these days and there is a comprehensive uh, prescription uh, repository integrated into the patient chart 
uh, repository. So this has been one of the most popular websites in Finland, and I already once mentioned Nokia. So I think that's one of the reasons why Finland has been a leading country in many ICT comparisons, healthcare in, in included for many years now. Finns are sort of uh, very digitalized people. Uh, of course, we always have to remember that there is also the digital divide phenomenon and not everybody is able to use the digital services, but an increasingly high percentage of even elderly people do so. So we have actually come to the point that people demand digital services and there is very little tolerance towards any flaws in the electrical patient record system uh, among professionals and among uh, the users, the patients, the citizens. So uh, this is the current uh, data architecture for healthcare and social welfare. Quite a busy slide and I'm not going to address it in detail, but it's the result of a bottom-up exercise, a little bit uh, on the contrary compared with uh, our neighboring country, Estonia. Uh, so it has its good and bad sides. So it it's, has been a flexible regional system, but at the same time, from the national point of view, it is quite fragmented. But I would like to draw your attention to the lower right-hand corner of this uh, picture, the latest additions, uh, additions to, to come to this ecosystem of data is the proposed genome database. And you will be hearing more about that in, in next presentations. Well. In order to overcome this fragmentation, as well as the fundamental difference between the primary and secondary use of this sensitive personal information, uh, Finland has, has this legislation on the primary and secondary use of personal data uh, for a little bit more than a year uh, now. And it is actually uh, seen from my point of view, one of the future cornerstones of the health growth strategy. And you will be hearing more about this also in the future. This has not been and is not and will not be an easy exercise. And actually, uh, the Finnish parliament, the constitutional committee of the Finnish parliament has just this morning uh, debated uh, some of the additions, new additions to this legislation. And there is quite a fierce discussion uh, among uh, the researchers, the uh, organizers, uh, leg uh, legal people, and so on, on, on the details of this legislation. Uh, but I only want to, to say that these things are not to be decided by researchers only. We deal here with deeply societal and political issues. And that is nothing that we as healthcare experts or uh, researchers, academia cannot circumvent. These are highly societal and political issues. Uh, how we handle people's data. And why is this? Why do I say this? Because it is all about the public trust. And the key elements to maintain trust are the high level of data protection and security. And this is something that the politicians don't want to compromise on on at all. Open communication and involvement of the citizens in, in uh, creating the rules and regulations. But at the same time, I want to say that we shouldn't over-regulate. And this is the debate that is ongoing in Finland right now. But because we need concrete demonstrations, how the utilization of data and, and, and innovative development enhances new treatments, medicine and health tech devices, bringing health and well-being to our people. So why are we doing all this? Uh, that is uh, the justification that we have to show to those uh, who we asked to write the legislation and support financially uh, all these actions. So this brings us to the uh, real title of my presentation, uh, Regulating the Unknown. So the Finnish, uh, the first proposed genome strategy, actually it always remained a proposal, uh, was published in 2015 and it 
already then aimed to establish a national genome center and a legal framework that will enable uh, genomic data to be used effectively in healthcare research and development, regardless of who can pay for the data and who has access, uh, access to, to research or medical care. Uh, so, equal opportunity to benefit from the use of genomic data with high ethical standard. And uh, this uh, document was put together very quickly uh, by experts and, uh, and civil servants together. And uh, it has been a long, long way, a rocky road, I would say. But now we are approaching, finally, I hope, uh, uh, that we, we could, the face that we could submit submit the new Genome Act to the Parliament. And this is also one of the topics of, of the forthcoming presentations during this, this meeting. Um, so I won't go more into the details. Uh, regulating the unknown, actually. Uh, so during our uh, EU Council presidency in 2019, we wanted to raise this issue. And one of the platforms for this discussion was uh, a uh, expert meeting arranged in Brussels called Genomics and Personalized Medicine in Public Health in October 2019. And then the first draft of this policy brief called Regulating the Unknown, uh, put together by the European Observatory, uh, was presented. Uh, and then it took some time to finalize the document, which was published in January of this year. So actually, the, the concept of public health genomics, which I'm personally very fond of, um, uh, was uh, first uh, introduced uh, by the Italian EU Council presidency in 2014. And that was uh, the time when the first uh, chapters for the policy brief were also authored. So we uh, had the opportunity and great privilege to build on that. That is a uh, illustration from the policy brief, which is about 40 pages long, and I highly recommend that those who are interested in this issue briefly uh, uh, check the document. Uh, but uh, this is a busy slide, but the message here is that actually the EU has been quite active in alerting the member states of all the necessary building blocks of personalized medicine. If you compare that with the international and global documents, so EU has been uh, quite uh, active, awake, and alert, I would say. And uh, the, uh, beyond one million genomes is just an addition uh, to that uh, very good sequence. I, I present the key messages of the regulating the unknown uh, policy uh, brief. Uh, uh, and the first slide I'm not going to read uh, aloud, you can browse through the text. But the, the key message here is that who is the target or, uh, audience of this kind of a policy brief document? Well, it's not just the experts, it's the health system administrators, decision makers, uh, parliamentarians, uh, lawyers. And uh, healthcare experts who are not daily working with genomics. And why, why is this? It's because the genomic medicine is already here. And they have to face these issues in their daily life. And they didn't learn about this in medical school or nursing school. And we have a huge educational challenge here uh, when we face uh, the, the introduction of genomic medicine to our health workforce. Public health experts. Public health experts are those who speak to the politicians and healthcare managers. So that's maybe the most important target audience from my point of view, my opinion. But also experts like you, because these kind of texts, they highlight the kind of questions that have been made and will be made when we introduce personalized medicine and genomic medicine and to practice and to our health systems. So it was quite a process to get this published. If you browse through the names of the authors, you see here there are some celebrities of public health. And we had quite tough discussions. But in the end of the day, uh, we all signed to this document. So the key messages are here. The benefits of genomics can only be realized uh, in addition 
to effective regulation. If there is broad societal trust, dialogue, all stakeholders, including industry, but also citizens uh, are involved in the development. Wider information infrastructure and digitalization strategies in general, so that genomic data can be linked to other information without breaching public trust. But also the policymakers are able and willing to manage the costs of get genomics driven innovation and ensure that benefits give value for money. So um, I, I found one slide which sort of uh, made me think of a very important addition to my message. Genomics is not the only type of new data that's being incorporated to traditional patient charts. And COVID-19 crisis has really opened our eyes uh, because it has revealed the need to understand more deeply what's going out there. And there is lots of other types of information that's being collected all the time. And we might not have been able to use in the best possible way when we try to monitor the impact of the COVID crisis on the society. So um, analyzing you know, people, people's uh, data that's generated by people themselves and up uh, to, to monitoring dark web can provide us quite reliable and also accurate information about behavioral changes. So, you know, I think the next phase is that somebody makes the question, why don't we make use of all this information when we try to, to promote people's well-being? So appropriate data governance and prevention of misuse become crucial issues, but also crucial assets to those countries who, who really can, can make this happen in a way that is following GDPR and maintaining public trust. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, approaching the end of my presentation, uh, dear colleagues, I, I really think that data and personalized medicine, genomic medicine will transform health systems. This is actually the right hand side of this group picture is an old picture which I borrowed from Arno Palotier, who is going to speak later during this, this meeting. But building a sustainable ecosystem that delivers, delivers is a joint venture of, of the government, which is almost always needed, the citizens, companies, authorities, and healthcare providers. And then there is a list of things that we need. Personally, I, I have to say that being able to promote these things to the degree that the minister can do, you, you cannot do that alone as a civil servant, but you need a whole lot of professional exercise, excellence medical, legal, ICT. So uh, if we only in the ministries work in Ivory Towers, we will never achieve our goals, but we need the expertise, uh, all the available expertise uh, from the country and internationally. So uh, this, this bird's eye view is, is sort of quite nicely reflected uh, in a couple of concluding points that Nick Fahey and Erika Richardson uh, from the University of Oxford and the European Observatory wrote in the phase one report of the external review of the health growth strategy uh, just about a year ago. And uh, we are going to continue this exercise uh, with an international expert panel site visit, hopefully physical site visit to Finland in November this year. And I'm reading this because I think this is a very well phrased uh, thing. In line with the EU emphasis on smart specialization, the life sciences industry and innovation systems are increasingly global. And the site of the original innovation is not necessarily where it is commercialized or the economic benefits accrue. While biomedical and technological innovations have the potential to have universal impact throughout health systems, the impact they actually have depends on the accompanying organizational innovations to put them into practice. So um, colleagues, uh, friends, the, the Finnish constitution says that the public authorities shall guarantee for everyone adequate social health and medical services and promote the health of the population. And this is the cornerstone of everything we do. And this is my, my personal uh, conclusion of this uh, rapid overview of the health growth strategy.
I strongly believe that sustainable implementation of personalized medicine is one of the many stress tests of modern health systems. And it will succeed if it addresses significant health problems, the solutions do add value and are available to everybody who needs them. Thank you very much.